attendees here in the Faculty Center. Uh, as you may have heard, Melissa just uh, started recording the session uh, so that uh, folks who weren't able to join us live uh, can uh, access the session uh, on the Faculty Center website after the fact. Um, so uh, my name is Laurel Pritchard. I am the Vice Provost for Undergraduate Education here at UNLV. Um, and the reason that I uh, organized this panel uh, and a follow-up workshop uh, that will happen in December uh, is twofold. Uh, first, uh, UNLV had a grant from the Association of American Colleges and Universities um, that was aimed specifically at uh, revising undergraduate curriculum uh, to make it more coherent, uh, more focused on student success, uh, and more focused on 21st century skills for students. Um, and this is kind of the culmination of that grant project. Um, and I needed to spend down some of the money and feed some people. So <laughs> thank you to those of you uh, who are here having lunch with us. Um, and the yeah. reason uh, for the timing of the event is that um, we've all, I think, had a chance over the past couple of years to sort of radically rethink the way we approach our teaching. And I, I think it's also maybe a good time for us to uh, step back and, and maybe rethink the way we design curriculum. Um, and so the purpose of today's panel is for uh, faculty to hear from some departments who have already gone through that process uh, who have done some pretty major revisions to their undergrad program curricula um, to hear about their experiences and how they approached that process. Um, and also to hear from uh, the Office of the Registrar uh, about the ways that they can support departments um, that are interested in embarking on this curricular revision journey. So that's what we'll be doing today. Um, I will let our panelists introduce themselves. Uh, and then I have some questions uh, and we'll have a little bit of time at the end for questions from attendees. Um, so we'll start with our in-person panelists. So Ruth. Hi, my name is Ruth Garay. I am from the Office of the Registrar. My title is the Assistant Registrar for Progression and Completion. Uh, it's a fancy name to just mean that I oversee curriculum and other units of the office, but for this purpose of the meeting is curriculum. So that's why I'm here. Hi, my name is Jake Thompson. I'm the Associate Chair in the Department of Communication Studies. Um, and if you watch the office, that's a little bit like me being the assistant to the regional manager. <laughs> Um, and uh, I've been the undergraduate coordinate, curriculum coordinator in that department now for a year and a half. Yeah. That's me. All right. And uh, Gail, if you'd like to unmute and introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Gail Sammons, and I'm a professor in the Hospitality College. I am chair of the college curriculum. That, and we went through a major curriculum revision um, that took three years. And also I am chair of the faculty senate curriculum. So the bottom line, if you want to make a change to curriculum, you've got to get through Gail Sammons. One way and, or Ruth. Another. and Ruth. And, and Ruth too. You're so powerful. <laughs> and Ying Tao. <laughs> Hey everybody, Yin Tao Jian, uh, professor of electrical and computer engineering. Currently, I'm the associate uh, dean of college engineering in charge of uh, undergraduate programs. All right, well, uh, before we start, I just wanna thank all of our panelists for making time uh, to be with us today and to share their 
ideas and their thoughts uh, and particularly their lessons learned um, from having gone through this process. So uh, I'll start with our, our first question for the panelists. Um, and if uh, Gail and Ying Tao, um, for anything that you wanna, wanna answer, feel free to just unmute yourselves and, and go ahead. Um, each of your departments or colleges has undertaken major revisions to your undergraduate program curriculum in recent years. What factors or events led to the decision that it was time for a revision? Start, but if they would like to go. Bill, you want to start first and I'll just uh, follow up? Yeah, go ahead. Great. Um, so I think that there were three primary factors that led to our decision to radically revise the, the curriculum and the communication studies department. Um, number one was that it had been stagnant, stale, and had not changed in any discernible way since I have been a faculty member here, which is now 14 years. So I would imagine prior to that um, as well. There's a, you know, uh, the old saying like uh, that if you're, if you're not, what is it, you're not changing, you're dying kind of thing, or if you're not evolving, you're, you're just slowly dying. Um, and I think that that was a, a big factor. There were, there had been a change in leadership in our department that pushed for some change, the dean had pushed for some change. There was a new undergrad coordinate, curriculum coordinator that pushed for some change. So. It was time, right? We were due. Um, secondly, oh, and I guess the, yeah, the other factor that kind of relates to that, is, the second one is that for a long time, our curriculum, I think was premised on the idea that like, we're going to be a boutique program that like, we're gonna attract the best students. Um, um, our graduate program was certainly premised on that. Um, and it was an MA only program. Um, and so we wanted to really broaden our appeal to students and kind of be realistic and meet students like where they're at and understand that like, if you have five or seven students that go on to get PhDs eventually, like there's a good chance that you had five or seven undergrad students that were like homeless in your undergrad cohort in any given year or that were um, students uh, who went through the foster care system. And it's like, you could be making a difference for 99% of the students or for 1% of the students. And we, we picked what side we were on. Um, and the third change was that the, the, the pandemic and the changes associated with it just kind of amplified both the urgency for this, as well as kind of our realization of kind of like the fact that we could make these changes and they could be successful. Those were really the three big factors that drove us to pretty radically revise our curriculum. Great, thank you. <clears throat> Gail or Ying Tao, would you like to share what led to the decision in your units? Yeah, I will. Um, we had not changed our curriculum any significant with faculty involvement since um, 2002. And so, we, we just needed to really look at it from bottom up. And so we put together a faculty ad hoc committee that um, then came out with some suggestions and then met with the faculty. And from the point in time the ad hoc committee started to the point in time that the curriculum um, went into effect was two and a half almost three years. Um, it was one year planning and it was uh, another nine months of faculty development with the curriculum. And at that point in time, then it was going through the curriculum process. Thank you. Okay, um, from college to engineering, I think there are many factors and events that um, are influencing <laughs> curriculum design and changes. Uh, I heard uh, panelists talking about uh, their programs have not gone through changes for a long time. Um, I interpret that as 
uh, way of saying some of the uh, curriculum is out of date. Okay. Um, and that is one factor because we understand a curriculum, uh, at least from our college, I see some of the curriculum is out of date. Um, and we are trying to uh, bring some of uh, the curriculum uh, back to the uh, uh, sales of art. Um, so we try to modernize the programs and uh, uh, really look at and modernize some specific courses. So, um, and actually we created quite a few uh, recently years, created some new courses in, um, around the uh, modern technologies that are uh, impacting our lives. Uh, for example, Internet of Things are introduced, uh, a course, very popular course now, um, um, and also we have some courses on machine learning, artificial intelligence, those courses that uh, didn't exist just uh, five years ago. Um, and also uh, faculty are talking about uh, doing more quantum computing kind of thing. Another factor that uh, we see to uh, influence curriculum uh, changes um, is related to um, how we handle the scheduled review process or specific meetings we have, uh, that we have just for curriculum uh, review and curriculum uh, issues. Um, for example, one of our departments has already established a two-year cycle to review the, uh, the program, electric engineering at my home department. And uh, mechanical engineering department, pretty much every faculty meeting, they have uh, agenda item on uh, curriculum change. So they look at uh, curriculum and if there's an issue or it's any uh, motion to make any changes that uh, those things are discussed um, on those um, regular faculty meetings. Uh, most likely it's going to be once every semester or even more frequently. Um, another factor or event is related to accreditation uh, review and needs. Uh, last two, three years ago, when computer science program was reviewed by uh, ABAT, uh, our accreditation agency, uh, they figured there must be a course on cybersecurity. And then that course was actually introduced into the curriculum. And ABAT visitor also mentioned that there, um, there were just too many logic classes. So they actually dropped one class offered by a service cl class offered by uh, electrical and uh, they keep the uh, logic class from uh, philosophy department. So they actually look at all these things. Um, um, and, and, and another big factor for our curriculum change, of course, related to student success. Uh, we recognize their, for example, um, students came into our program from high school, often didn't have adequate math and uh, uh, computer skills. And we tried to uh, add uh, courses or programs to support you know, that. Um, uh, and of course, we see that uh, our first year experience class is, was not very uh, successful in terms of educating students and retaining students in the program, we actually changed the curriculum as well. So we tried to make sure that students were successful in uh, getting to our program and all the way to, um, to finish line. So actually we add a few um, units classes, other service classes, uh, civil engineering also did something there. And we also look at our curriculum uh, complexity and, and uh, brands decision support office help us do some uh, uh, complex analysis on our programs and uh, curriculum and we made uh, changes also there. Another factor I would say is related to our improved or added the new capabilities from our research and, uh, and uh, uh, equipment donation from uh, our, our partners, uh, industry or community partners. Um, for example, we actually added uh, photonics into one of the uh, areas uh, that uh, we would uh, our like our students to be exposed to um, because we got a, a couple of faculty members very active in that particular area. Um, and we have new equipment, new curriculum uh, in place to uh, accommodate students in need of that um, specific area. Um, Biomatic is another area that uh, we're trying to expand and uh, uh, within the uh, Next year or so, we 
will hire new fact members in that area. And I'm sure uh, some new curriculum will be called up there. And entertainment engineering, because we recently got a few uh, you know, uh, grants there. Uh, so we're actually adding uh, VR, virtual reality, and argument reality courses. Um, and, and so, so basically with the uh, more funding coming to our way, more research expertise is being developed, uh, we are able to modernize and improve our curriculum. Um, these are a few things that uh, were factors that uh, I can see that drive the, uh, uh, the curriculum change or improvement. Well, thank you all. So I'm, I'm seeing some kind of broad categories um, of factors emerging. There are some of these internal factors uh, like faculty concerns over stagnation or curriculum being out of date um, or student success and equity concerns. And then I'm also seeing some external drivers for change. Um, so Ying Tao mentioned accreditation, and I think that's a really interesting double-sided coin because often what we hear um, from, from faculty or from departments is, well, we can't change our curriculum because our accreditor requires that we have classes on these concepts. Um, but I think accreditation can be an equally powerful driver for change. Uh, and so, you know, when you have those accreditation visits, listening uh, to the feedback can really help you to understand where you have opportunities. Um, and then sometimes uh, you have opportunities for change based on grants or donations uh, to an academic unit. So those are all uh, great and very valid reasons. Um, so my next question for the panelists is, how did you identify specific areas in your curriculum where change was needed? Specifically, what kinds of data did you look at and whose feedback did you consider as you identified those areas? I'll take this one first. We first looked at um, our assessment reports and they kept, some of the things just kept pointing out that it was, <sighs> nothing was changing. It was all static. And we had a national advisory board who um, also was questioning some of our courses. Mm -hmm. One of the main areas that they felt that our students weren't coming out in was not just necessarily in the finance area, but in revenue management and, the, and pricing and things like that. And yeah, um, a makeshift elective had been added about five years ago, but that wasn't that wasn't meeting any any need for the industry. So we interviewed alums. We went to the industry here in town. And we asked faculty to reach out to recruiters or industry people that they knew, and we also um, interviewed some students, both present. And those that um, were graduating and used all of the data to then bring into the table that we started with a blank sheet and said, what knowledge, skills, and dispositions do we want our students who graduate from our program to know and went, went forward from there? Or dreading my answer down. <laughs> um, so uh, the first thing to note is that uh, we identified all of the areas. We we're like, we need we need a big change. Problem. So um, I think that we started initially with some of our lower division classes, especially the classes that are massive. Uh, Theaters for lots of other disciplines. And so specifically COM 101 was an area that we started uh, a big change in. That class has like 3,000 plus students go through it um, a year. Um, and we're not a giant major either. I think we have like three, 400 majors total. Um, you know, obviously the number fluctuates. Uh, and we're working on improving that as well. But um, we needed to 
update some of our basic courses to start. And then we've kind of continued working on those as well. Um, some of the other information was information that we sought out um, from specific areas, whether it was like inquiry to your office or through UNLV data analytics. Um, one of our big kind of wake up moments was a report on the DFIW rate in COM 101. And I might kind of mess these numbers up, but like the spirit of what I'm about to say is right, even if the exact number isn't. And I, I think that the number of students getting a D, an F, an I, or a W in COM 101 uh, four years ago was like in the mid 20s, like mid 20%. So like a quarter of the students were failing or leaving COM 101. And it just like, when I heard that, I was astounded. Like if you're failing a quarter of the students in anything, like you're doing it wrong. Like something has to change, like something's got to give. Um, and so that was very concerning to us. Uh, we immediately launched a kind of revision of COM 101 that led to the number now being somewhere in the neighborhood of 10%. Our goal is to have it at like, you know, five or 6% if we can. Like you can, you can lead the students to water, but you can't always make all of them drink, but you can get about 94 or 5% of them to drink if you're trying real hard, right? Um, and so some of that data, additional data about other classes as well came from UNLV data on lakes. And the third important um, way that we identified areas and kind of led us to consider all of them uh, was the direction of our college, which is the reason my college of urban affairs is very interesting, kind of like being the college of solutions. It's a college of community connection. Um, and it's College of Engagement. And a lot of our curriculum was not really aligned with that mission. It was like a boutique program. We're going to talk about ancient rhetoric in Greece. And like, that's all great. And it can be applied to modern day. But like, if you don't make that explicit, you're not doing, um, you're not really kind of like falling in line with the goals and mission of the college, much less university. Um, and the last thing I'll say is we took some data from our instructors um, and other faculty members who were concerned about student performance in upper division classes. Now, part of the answer is to probably like, address how those upper division classes are designed, which we're in the process of doing as well. But we did also kind of radically transform the required classes in our department um, and made a couple 200 level classes that were kind of like introductory methods classes that help students analyze communication either from a social science perspective or from a kind of broadly speaking humanities perspective, um, which were designed to also be kind of writing intensive and experiential that should ideally help students succeed in um, you know, our three and 400 level classes. Um, with more regularity and just to generally be more prepared for those upper division classes. So we took the, 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 the direction from like, you know, we kind of need to change everything. There's some evidence from UNLV data analytics, some evidence from the college generally, and evidence from instructors. Um, and I'm going to add kind of a follow up uh, to that question for Ruth specifically. Um, can you talk a little bit about? Um, the kinds of data or information that your team might be able to provide to departments um, that might be useful for them to identify areas in their curriculum that might be ripe for change? So um, you guys, uh, any faculty, any department can always reach out to the office and ask for any type of query um, as long as you're using it for you know, as intended. Um, the EAS team will actually create a lot of those queries for the departments in regards to student data. Um, internally, what uh, the team can offer is more uh, basic queries, like identifying maybe your courses, providing information in that sense. I know that we helped uh, business just recently obtained a list of all of their courses with their prerequisites, which allowed them to review what's in the system. Sometimes those prerequisites or, or that course description or things like that is out there forever and um, no changes are done. And so then it, it does become static 
but you may not be aware of it. And um, when we give those lists out, that that is very valuable information in regards to you understanding what the students are actually seeing, um, because we know you don't go out there and try to register yourselves, right? So um, this is very valuable information that you can obtain from, from at least my unit. Um, another thing that we can provide is maybe schedule, uh, how often they've been scheduled, um, when were they last scheduled? Um, and then the other resource that we have is the CCN database, which is actually available to everybody, but not everybody goes in and uses it. Um, and we can always ask NSHE for reporting in that sense. So if you're interested in finding out if a different uh, institution is teaching a course or something similar, we can always reach out, reach um, the CCN database and find out. So that'll be very valuable information for you to sort of create more of an educated um, decision in regards to the direction you want to take your curriculum. Thank you. And uh, for those of you who have not had contact with it, the CCN database is common course numbering. Um, sorry, Gail, I know that might be triggering for you. <laughs> I know you have strong feelings about common course numbering, but uh, and she does have a policy that uh, if institutions have courses that have at least 80% overlap in, uh, in the course content, that those courses be numbered the same at the different institutions across the system. So that's a step in the curriculum process to make sure that you're not uh, creating a course that somebody else already has numbered. Um, so thank you for that. Another... Uh, useful piece of information that I know some departments that I've worked with have requested um, from the Office of the Registrar is the, the number of waivers and exceptions that students in their programs need to graduate. If you are seeing a lot of waivers and exceptions, that may be a sign that you're not offering a course frequently enough <laughs> um, and, and maybe want to think about scheduling it differently, or maybe even that you could move the content um, that the students need into a different course, um, consolidate it with something else that you are able to offer on a more regular basis. Okay, I'm gonna move on um, to our next question. I'm gonna skip around on our list a little bit. Um, so did any of you encounter any technical challenges um, and, and maybe you can talk a little bit about the CCN challenges, Gail, um, as you were making your revisions. Um, if so, what were they and how did you overcome them? Yeah, um, so the common course numbering uh, has been around for a long time and I have been a proponent of the, the book, um, stopping it from day one. So um, it has its its good points. You know, we, we are a system and we need to, you know, if we're going to have degrees at, at two different universities, then maybe they should have um, some of the similar, you know, if it's a marketing course, it's a marketing course. If it's specialized marketing course, then that's that's a little different. But the issue that we really were dealing with at the time was um, the community, co um, the College of Southern Nevada was going through the process to be able to offer a four-year bachelor of uh, uh, applied sciences. And applied sciences do not, those courses will not transfer for a four-year bachelor's and getting that understood so that they couldn't lay ground to the fact that they have the exact same course in their curriculum or they're going to create it in their curriculum. We, we definitely had some, some really major discussions. We had a couple one-on-one -on -one meetings and we called in Nishi to kind of oversee it. Um, and some went our way, some, some didn't. Um, we also were going from uh, using 
two or three different um, prefixes to one prefix for the required core. And so a TCA course wasn't going to be a TCA course anymore. It was going to be an HMD course. And to get them to understand that they could still have it as TCA and we could have it as the same as was, you know, just getting through those processes and um, getting communication down to the departments where it mattered and not just sitting at the, at the college level in, in the, uh, in their, I don't even know if they call it their provost's office, but um, it, yeah, there was issues with ownership and that had to be, um, you know, separated. There were also some um, personality issues. Um, this is a, you know, a small city and um, we have a, we've had students that have gone on and teach over there or, or, um, couples that we have one teaching here and one teaching over there and so they go in with their we all go in with our our thought process and we just had to eliminate those negative thoughts we got it through um after it was a year long process getting through common course numbering that delayed us one whole year because also nishi decided that 100 and 200 level courses have to be okayed by December um, in order to be um, the articulation agreements to be completed. And um, they are 100 and 200 were a couple of the, the major sticking points. And so we were delayed a whole year because of common course numbering. So that of course sits in my craw frequently, but um, it's there, we, we're, we're, we're dealing with it. Um, it's, it is part of the process, but they somehow, I just hope and pray that no one else is ever held hostage by the situation like we were. It took us a year and eight months to get through the common course numbering process. And that was way before, way before the uh, pandemic. Thanks, Gail. And I, I think your, your college was in a, a pretty unique situation in that CSN was trying to put together that um, applied degree at the exact same time. Uh, but the take home message is, you know, be aware <laughs> that there are these rules around common course numbering. And if you hear from Ruth <laughs> or her team, that there is a CCN issue with some uh, course that you've proposed. Um, take action as soon as you can, get in contact with the chair of the department that offers uh, the course in question at the other institutions and, and have a conversation. Um, Better yet, do that pre as you're, yeah. as you're developing your curriculum. Go and, and start those processes. Um, some, some of the engineering and the sciences have started that. And it, it looks like it seems to be paving the way for, for, for a good change, so. Yes, more communication earlier is better. Anybody else encounter any technical challenges, Jake? The one uh, potential technical challenge that we encountered that was overcome quite quickly was that uh, we changed all of the required prerequisites for all of our upper division classes. And I was very afraid that I was gonna have to set aside like an entire month of my life to like enter each one painstakingly into curriculum. And like, I was really afraid of all of this. And so I started an email exchange with Ruth and their office. And I don't know if I should like publicly air this because I don't know if you like do this for everyone or not, <laughs> but Go ahead. okay. Um, <laughs> but she let us send her basically it was the same change for every upper division course we just sent her essentially i think it was a microsoft word doc or a spreadsheet one or the other with all of the information instead of entering every one of them manually into curriculum their office kind of did it on the back end for us and i assume it was less maybe not maybe it was worse for them i'm not sure but there were definitely less mistakes made i think the total number was zero on their end uh so 
that was one potential difficulty that was overcome quite quickly with help from your office. So thank you for that. Can I just add real quick? That, that issue is still happening today, especially with uh, the fact that we um, uh, are reinforcing, not, not that we invented this policy, but that uh, it's been there and it, it just, we didn't have the manpower to really enforce it previously, but recently we've gone back to it in regards to the cross listings. And so um, this, this area uh, is particularly difficult for courses <coughs> like uh, the debate courses or uh, comb combined courses that really don't fit that definition. Uh, one of those examples is like the choir ensembles, for example. So now music is having the conversations as to whether or not they need different levels or can they create one course that will allow all levels to get into. So that, that communication was never uh, held before. And so there is pros and there's cons to, to us enforcing the policy that exists. Um, just, just be aware of those policies. I think that's the take home here. And we'll try to help you as much as we can. And if you're not sure, ask Ruth. <laughs> or Gail. <laughs> or Gail. <laughs> um, can I see a few words on that? Yeah. Sure. Um, I think there are quite a few uh, challenges here, but I just want to particularly sing it, uh, bring this uh, resource issue up. Um, because we have, our college has gone through a lot of changes, a lot of uh, improvements. Um, you know, we have uh, new revamped, uh, you know, first year experience class. Uh, now we're introducing a second year experience class and uh, we actually offer modular uh, middle semester classes with the strong support from uh, Laura Yu on that. Um, and and, and uh, uh, we are actually teaching physics and the math um, courses um, ourselves. So we, we have gone down a lot, a lot of the, those things. And uh, uh, one, of course, a uh, big challenge was the, uh, the financial uh, support or resource we need to, uh, to run those uh, changes or new initiatives. Um, and, 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 and we got a tremendous support from uh, Provost Office. Laurie, you have been uh, phenomenal in providing that kind of support to us. Um, also, but still, uh, I mean, I also got uh, uh, tremendous support from my, uh, my boss team and uh, uh, my college. Um, and departments are very much aligned with us on that. Um, but still, I have a concern still maybe down the road uh, we have sustainability issue because, you know, this program, the changes need to be implemented and the cost money, human resource to do these things. Um, so... Uh, we're actually uh, seeing uh, faculty, you know, we're still getting a, a lot of support from provost office and uh, and, and, uh, and Bing's office on that. Um, but our faculty are also um, working to get external support. Like say, uh, I saw one faculty, Hyrule Stephen, Dr. Hyrule Stephen there from civil engineering. He got some, uh, you know, million dollars of grant from an, uh, an SF to, to develop some new courses, uh, you know, for civil engineering program. Um, so, and there, there are quite a few other uh, initiatives or, uh, uh, or pending uh, grants that, um, just to support that. So, so we're seeing this could be a challenge and we're, to address that, it, the resources have to come from provost office, things office, faculty themselves who initiate those changes. And also uh, our community partners actually also are helping us. We see uh, donations, um, uh, sometimes in kind some cash um, to help us sustain and grow those uh, uh, our, our, our programs. So we're, we're um, but again, uh, this is always uh, uh, on the table. You gotta you know, work on that to address this uh, resource uh, challenge. All right, thank you. Um, I'll just ask one more question and then we'll open it up uh, for attendees to ask questions. Um, I know that um, probably you've only had the opportunity to gather data um, on the impact of the changes you've made for a year, maybe two at most, uh, but are you seeing any early signs uh, that 
the changes you made to curriculum are having the effect that you hope they would? Yes, we are. One of the things we put in is that we, uh, when they take um, their second level, second, it's a 200 level class, it is required before they can get into any of the courses. Um, they have to do a Word, PowerPoint, and Excel certification through lynda.com. Um, and it has really, we're already seeing the difference in the courses above that, that require 200 as their prereq, that they're, we're getting a lot better PowerPoint presentations. I'm seeing um, better worded um, format in uh, Word. And I know our accounting faculty are seeing it in, in the Excel. So there's that. And the fact that we're required, we changed our math requirement from algebra down to, uh, or to 120, which is more business math. And um, we're not only seeing the improvement in the retention through the math course, but we're seeing them applying it in the courses that they could never see the application before. And um, that those two right there just make all of the uh, nail biting and, and stuff like that, that go away. And that 200 class is only available at UNLV. They, you know, without one we fought for and, and um, everyone that graduates from our program has to take that. So if you come in from CSN and you, you still have to take that class and we're already seeing two years in that it, it's really been a good decision. Thanks. Anybody else wanna chime in on that one? Yeah, um, as I mentioned at our, um, uh, we did a lot of work in our first year experience class, and um, actually we split that class into two with the uh, uh, sponsor board from Laura and others uh, to make it the first year and the second year experience classes all together. Um, the two courses accounted for two credit hours it used to be just uh, one class. So now we split into two classes, each one is in one credit hour. And uh, we have been running this uh, first year experience class lab for three, years, ever since I took over the position. And, you know, we see that um, that, that class contributed significantly to our um, improved retention rates. Uh, at some point we did some calculation, but um, maybe like a, right now we're at uh, retention, first year retention is about 3%. And uh, at least six to 8% of that uh, increase is directly tied to, um, you know, this uh, first year experience class we have. Um, and so that's a very good sign. Now we're running this uh, second year experience class right now for the first time this semester. So we're hoping this class will, but it, so far from the student feedback, we see this is pretty good. So we're hoping this class will also help um, us to improve the uh, second year's retention numbers. So uh, with those, if we students can really navigate the first two years of their study, likely they will graduate uh, within the engineering. So, so we're seeing that uh, retention numbers are really, really improving. Um, with the, uh, the classes. And also we have other classes like CS-135, the computer science classes. All these changes actually we see uh, numbers are better. Um, and, uh, um, and the student feedback is pretty positive. For example, we uh, I just heard recently from students saying, you know, lacking our faculty teaching calculus, um, students, you know, uh, experiences are so positive. They just want to us continue. Of course, uh, we are continuing. Uh, so this is really a good thing. Thank you. Okay. Yes, just one We've seen the, um, we've been tracking the very close to the DFIW rate in COM 101. It's like the, the biggest metric that it's pretty easy for us to track. And uh, the changes that we made three years ago, now two, two and three years ago now, have uh, quartered the, the DFIW rate, uh, definitely more than halved it. So uh, like I said, it was in the mid twenties and it ranges between like 10 and 12 now. Um, and, and I said, we're, we're, we're planning a second revision, a re revision of COM 101. 
um, for the fall of 22. And we expect that that revision should drop the DFIW rate down into the, 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 the mid single digits is our, is our real hope. That coupled with some other like kind of student success initiatives for 101 and our other lower division classes we think are making a big difference to uh, new students um, and not just in our department, but across the university. All right, thank you. So I think we have at least one question in the chat. Uh, Sean says, I'm interested in knowing what aspects of 21st century skills, if any, your program has emphasized in the program changes um, and what are the key players in curriculum changes? Uh, Melissa, can I chime in? Sure. Yes, so I asked these two questions I re because I really enjoyed all the three present, uh, the presentations from the three different programs. They follow, they fall into two big uh, curriculum design models. One is a subject-centered design. The other is a problem-centered design. And then uh, what is missing is the learner-centered design that emphasizes on students learning and their experiences. And then who are the uh, key players? Are learners part of the key players in the curriculum changes or de redesign? So that's why uh, I'm having these two questions that hopefully help the, uh, the panelists to see uh, whether maybe you have um, shown the, you have done these things. Uh, I'm interested in hearing a little bit about how students are uh, experienced and their interests and particularly 21st century skills are involved in the design. Thank you. Yeah, um, I think the integral part of any curriculum revision is the faculty in bringing all of them together to understand it, especially if you have a broad scope in your, in your college where we have, you know, lots of different types of areas in our hospitality industry, how we can make sure that all of the areas are covered within the courses and how we, if we had to support bringing knowledge to the faculty to be able to do that. So the faculty, the students were integral in the planning process in the respects that we wanted to stare, we wanted to step their knowledge where we introduce the information and then you um, reinforce it the next one with additional information and then they apply it either by the end of the second course or the third course. And we have gotten really good feedback. For instance, we have a, a sequence of HR, leadership and organizational behavior. And so, and, and employment law. And so in the HR class, we talk about introducing the employment laws, but tell them in 310, they will not only learn more about the law, the specifics of the law, but they will be applying the, the law. And if there's a leadership information that we introduce in um, HR, we talk about how they're going to um, learn how that affects the company through leadership. And then in the leadership class, we talk about the different um, aspects, both individual and organizational. And we explain that in 305, they will put, be putting these to, to use and to application. And the students I'm seeing are coming, I, I teach the very beginning class and I teach uh, the OB class and they're coming back saying, oh my God, yeah, we, we read about this. So I learned about this in this class and now I'm seeing how important it is to our industry. So they're being able to make that connection. And I'm, I've asked some other faculty that teach a beginning level and a senior level if they're seeing that too. So it it. It's important to keep both the student and the faculty, the faculty in the respects that sometimes they need to be retooled. And, and for a faculty member to say, oh, I need to have some retooling. Oh, no, no, that means I might have to go back to class or whatever. And, uh, and then we also created some master courses online with our, our to put our 
um, degree online, and that really helped solidify how we had stair stepped and at combined these courses together to make sure that we were um, completing that in the master courses. Um, I would add a few words on here, Sean. This is a big. Uh, the questions you raised are big. You could we could talk for hours on just that. But I would share four perspectives quickly. Um, the courses actually, or the programs are developed um, from four different uh, constituents, I would mention here, at least. Um, for example, uh, one class right now we're going to, we just started to offer, actually I helped create in this, this summer and now it's being offered right now and it's being repeated next semester, is we create a class called the CubeSat to develop satellites that are small enough that it can be launched maybe in a few years. So NASA is working with us on that. Um, that actually was a project or a course uh, needed by students. They initiated the, you know, this course. And then college figured out that's something we have to help them to do that. So we, I reached out to the physics department and then uh, there's a meeting with NASA personnel uh, uh, Wednesday to just to create this course. Actually, it's being offered very successful, successfully. Second, you know, uh, thing is that, uh, you know, um, the purpose office is, was promoting this uh, cloud computing initiative. Uh, I'm sure, Laura, you, you're fully aware of that. Uh, Provost Kibi is pretty big on that. Um, and then right now, uh, we're working to work with uh, a, um, uh, Amazon Web Service that, uh, you know, they offer courses in a cloud, uh, cloud computing and um, kind of like uh, machine learning. And, that, um, and then our electrical computer engineering department and computer science department, both departments actually are adopting these courses now. I mean, next, next semester, these courses will be offered regularly to students. So this is coming down from the autonomous uh, higher up, you know, in terms of um, building our curriculum. Another thing is that you can see also, um, our faculty themselves are, are taking the initiative to build, uh, to modernize our curriculum, bringing 21st century technologies into the classroom. Uh, for example, I just mentioned uh, photonics, actually. Courses like a biosensing using photonics is really, um, you know, uh, great potential. And then this courses, this courses along, along this line or brought into the curriculum. And the last thing is that, of course, it's just a um, large note that sometimes it's external driving force there, um, you know, um, our one of our faculty attended recently attended the uh, um, NSFPI meeting, um, and, and then um, the faculty heard that there's a momentum to create quantum computing kind of course or courses. And then, you know, faculty are working on that. So, you know, th these these things can be started from students, from the administrators, from our faculty, and uh, um, in our uh, you know external. Um, people, external funding agencies, all these things are pushing us to modernize our, our courses and try to give the best possible education experiences here at the Um I would just add very briefly that um, the, the, main, the main model, I think, that guided our changes were the, was the curriculum, uh, I'm sorry, was the learner-centered model. Um, everything that we're doing is guided by like how students are uh, learning in the classroom and working hard to make that learning as interactive as possible. A brief anecdote is that tomorrow for the first time in a public policy advocacy class that I teach, I'm having actors come into the class and students will be participating individually in one-on-one -on -one conversations with these actors and the actor is portraying someone who is vaccine hesitant and they're enacting public policy advocacy strategies to try hard to have a conversation that moves them forward. Now, it's not like they're gonna jab them in the arm with a needle by the end of the 10 minute conversation, but the idea is to leave the door open for a future conversation where they may be less hesitant. And so examples like that abound across our college that that one is literally at the forefront of my mind because I'm like, oh, do I have the laptops in the right spot to record the conversations, et cetera. Um, but that, that has driven everything that we've done. And I'll echo what some other uh, presenters said, that scalability uh, is very important to us. So the 100 should lead into the 200s and they should make sense and lead into the three and the 400s. 
and that we have a new focus on assessment, which is something I've known about for a long time and have tried hard to do, but I think that we have kind of new expertise in our department that is helping us. We work closely with the Office of Assessment to um, make sure that our courses are accessible and we're revising the learning outcomes in every one of our undergraduate uh, un lower division undergraduate courses again now um, so look forward to that coming through the curriculum pipeline here soon um, in order to make sure that they are as accessible as possible well tied to the ULOs departmental learning outcomes and that the course learning outcomes are clear um, and that the students, the things that we are assessing are the things that we really want students to be doing, which are real world experiential and learning activities. All right, so clearly we could have devoted at least two hours, maybe three, um, to this topic, but I want to thank all of our panelists for making the time to share with us today. Round of applause for them. <laughs> Uh, and thank you uh, to uh, our Zoom attendees, our in-person attendees. Um, I, I'm hearing things that as, as an administrator, just give me tingles. <laughs> they make me so happy um, because it's, it's so clear that we have faculty and departments who are really thinking deeply about what is the best way to help our students learn and to prepare them for the problems and the challenges that they will face once they leave here. So um, it, it's deeply gratifying to me <laughs> to hear you all talk about those things. So uh, thank you all so much. Um, for those of you who are here, there's ample food left. I don't know if any of our uh, in-person panelists can stick around for a few minutes if any of you in the room have questions, but uh, I'm here and, and happy to do so. Just to finish, um, you know, we had a planned question and I prepped so well for that. But um, I think the bottom line from, from my perspective that I wanna leave every faculty here and on campus is that um, there will be shortcomings with my office. There's, we're short staffed and there's always a lot of work, more work than people, right? But the bottom line is that we, we are here for you in whatever capacity that we can help you in. Um, think of us as a liaison. We connect you with other departments that might be thinking of something similar. And between the two departments, you guys can collaborate. Uh, we connect you with, with other resources. Uh, and, and so think of us as that. And, and hopefully those shortcomings will be minimal. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, Bruce, I actually just wanted to com compliment what you guys have been doing because, uh, you know, uh, you guys have displayed the highest possible uh, professionalism here. I'm, I'm very happy to work with uh, your office. And of course, because right last week I had a meeting, it was pretty good about the physics, you know, thing. So um, you guys are amazing. I mean, I understand you're, you're understaffed, but you're, you're doing a great job. Right? Thank you. Thank you. We try. <laughs> I, I told Ruth while we were having lunch that I feel like I owe the office of the registrar about a thousand favors <laughs> between, you know, all of the things that they, all the problems they have helped us solve uh, over the past couple of years that some of them that seemed pretty intractable, but they've been amazing partners.